Slam poetry. He doesn't care if it's perfect. It's time to slam now. It's the biggest poem I've got inside of me. She was a thief. You brought to love me is to love a haunted house. Yelling, angry. The blood black nothingness began to spin. Specific point of view on things. To this day, I hate pork you chops. Me. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. Hello, everyone. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for sticking around. And thanks for just being. Just being. I don't have to thank you for anything in particular. I just thank you for you. Thank you for being you. My name's Andrew. Welcome to I Think, Therefore, I Slam. Thank you for all the feedback and all the encouragement there's been for the show so far with the first batch of episodes out there doing their thing. It means a lot. Today, I've got a very special guest. She is one of the real like up and coming spoken word artists in the country and she's actually the current Australian Poetry Slam champion coming to us live from country Victoria somewhere out in the sticks looks like you're in a shed or something there hope there's not too many spiders KJ Hayward how you doing I'm all good thank you how are you (laughs) I'm doing well I'm doing really well and you are coming to us live somewhere out in the sticks we were talking audio before you were saying that you're just roughing it on a phone at the moment, but hey, we're going to make it work. That's that's what we do here at I Think Therefore I Slam. So thank you again for joining us. No, that's thank you very much for having me. This is an amazing opportunity. Congratulations on your podcast. This is definitely something that's been on my bucket list. So you're really helping me tick things off. So I really appreciate it. Wow. He's been on a podcast on your bucket list, is it? Yes, definitely. Oh, amazing. <laughs> I'm very proud to uh, to help you get one step closer to death. No, <laughs> that's not what, it's not like, oh yeah, there's, you know, a hundred things ticked off the bucket list. Now we're done. That was a horrible intro from me. <laughs> Moving on. KJ, I've asked you to prepare a couple of your amazing pieces for our listeners today. We're going to jump straight in with your first one. Is there anything you wanted to say about this one before you start? I get a lot of my inspiration for poetry from conversations that I have with my family. They're very, very talented, amazing, open-minded people, and we have some really cool conversations. And this is about my my brother, who is just so completely himself all the time. He's never spent a day in school, so he's homeschooled for all of his all of his primary school years up till now. He's in grade four. And this is just about a conversation that I had with mum about him. (laughs) So he was, I'll just give you some context. He was playing with his Lego one day and my sister walked in and picked up a piece and go, oh, she's really cool. And he goes, no, she, that's not a she. Don't make assumptions. They're non-binary. Other people can wear dresses. Like it's not a girl. (laughs) And just that, if he was put into a school, would be really difficult to include you know such a wide variety of ideas and people in the worlds that he create in his games because there are so many lines drawn in a school area Mm. so yeah this is really a poem for when he does go out into the world i really hope that he keeps his big heart and his open mind those are definitely the two my two favorite things about him he's a really cool person (laughs) yeah so this is called doll amazing take it away Dear baby boy, the one that cradles the Barbie doll, baby doll, listen to your mama. You know she knows best. She's got a nose for these things. When you're all growing up, things are going to start changing, but don't you change, baby. Don't you let them other boys drive the rosy pink out of your cheeks with their Tonka trucks. It's our favorite color. It reminds us of laughter. Boy, never stop laughing. Laugh until you cry, baby, and when you cry, don't you let them other boys weave your tears into the patchwork of patriarchy. You don't belong there. Know where you belong, baby, and when them other boys invite themselves into that special place called woman, you wait outside on the welcome mat. You may invite your manners in, but if she ever comes knocking at your place, close the door behind you. Life is not a race. We take things one at a time, baby. And when you're going down that street, you better pay attention to the red lights and the stop signs. Be sure to wave a couple of them red flags through, though, because before you toot your own horn, be sure to have all your ducks in a row. Don't give me that look, baby. Mama knows everything. She's got a nose for these things. Don't go stomping on the world in your steel cap boots, stilettos, her just as much when kicked in the right place baby boy you are gonna make mistakes life is not a fairy tale just don't be the little boy bluebird with the yellow brick teeth 
Jumping on every Dorothy you pass in the street, no baby. Mama raised you to be the boy who stops to sing to the rainbow. You have a voice, baby. Take it from Mama, you will have no problem using it, but remember to listen. People don't need you speaking over them. They can speak for themselves if they have someone to talk to. Now, enough talk, baby boy, as you have some growing up to do. <laughs> Very good, KJ. Thank you for sharing that one. I know that you did that on my request. And hey, look, you got me again. As in, <laughs> just like the first time I, I heard you do that one at uh, the Victorian final of the Australian Poetry Slam, I'm sitting here in my room tearing up. I really do find that so moving. And uh, thank you for sharing some of the story behind that as well, that it's about your younger brother. I'm the youngest of three. I've got two mm. older sisters as well. I don't really know what it's like to have a younger sibling and to dream about the world that they might be a part of and who that they might become as you watch them grow older. Yeah, thank you so much for that. No, that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned before that you get a lot of inspiration through your family and some of the conversations that you have. And you mentioned that your family's very creative, very open-minded, I think were some of the words that you used. Is there a bit of a creative streak in your family? Certainly. <laughs> I yeah. have... I don't know how to put it exactly but they are all just so good with words and they and poetry it's all words and and it's these conversations that I really grasp an idea of what my values are and what my core beliefs are mm. and I definitely have to pay a lot of credit to them because they are purely my inspiration <laughs> And yeah, so I have, we've got artists in the family, we've got story writers, we have comic artists, we've got other poets, it's just everything is kind of thrown in there. Yeah. Um, and definitely when I'm speaking, I'm just a projection of their voices, like this is all our ideas and I'm just kind of the person who organises it into stanzas, but yeah, these are definitely, they definitely originate from everyone else. Wow, what a way of putting it. I really like that, the fact that you're saying that in your head and in your work is a melting pot of all kinds of people and experiences. That sounds amazing. Your family sounds so cool. <laughs> they are very cool. <laughs> <laughs> very cool. So, KJ, I'd like you to take us back about this time last year. You had never performed your work in a public place before. Is that correct? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. So, 12 months ago... You'd never performed your work in a public space before. Talk about how you ended up at a local heat for the Australian Poetry Slam. Where were you? How did you find out about it? What went down? Okay. So my first performance was at an open mic night uh, run by Ballarat Spoken Word. And we were coming down the Stuart Highway after being in Darwin for a while to come visit family. And I just were like, yeah, I've got a, a huge portfolio of poems. I, I want to start performing them. So the great thing about homeschool is that we get to resource our own learning. So I uh, jumped online, sent a few emails, and then uh, I was on my way to my first um, open mic night. And it just went up from there. So I performed, which I think this is quite beautiful, but um, I performed an extended version of the Ode to My Teachers poem, which was also my winning poem at the Sydney Opera House mm. so it was like my big poem was also my first poem so yeah that ties really nice everyone was so supportive there it was incredible the second that I finished that poem I was like oh I want to go again I was buzzing like mm. the whole night and then when we had like a 20 minute break just you know just my luck, two representatives from the Australian Poetry Slam were sitting in the audience and said that we're doing um, a heat in Shepparton. Have you heard of the APS? Would you like to join? Would you mm. like to come? We think that you're really cool. And I was like, oh my God, yes, I've wanted to, I've wanted to go to one of these heats since I was like 12. Yeah. <laughs> so it was, yeah, it was like the biggest coincidence and the best coincidence that has ever happened wow. to me. And then from that time, the, um, my fourth performance was the national finals in the Sydney Opera House. I'd never been on a plane before. I'd never been to Sydney, let alone inside the Sydney Opera House on the stage performing. So it was all very new. 
and it still feels like a very big fluke. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was incredible. Just everyone who was part of that journey were mm. incredible and very inspiring and supportive mm. of yet someone so new to performing their poetry. Mm. I could not have asked for a better journey or better entry into this poetry. Yeah, what a way to start off. It's it's truly a great story. So you did the open mic night, then you had the heat in Shepparton out in country Victoria. I imagine this was your first time you had ever been, well, you do receive a, a score for your work when you enter these heats because yeah. it is a national competition with with particular rules and stuff. What did it feel like when you were realizing that your work was resonating with people? It really is a big shock to think because like before this, I was just performing to my family and, mm. and they're my peer squad. They're supportive no matter what I write. Yep. <laughs> and so to put that out there with people who've been doing this for a while and getting such high scores and positive feedback was like, I found my thing. I My passion is really in this. I'm doing something good. It was really reassuring. Yeah, and I don't get nerves very often, but that, that shepherd in heat was probably the most nervous I've ever felt. Yeah. Yeah, since, like, since I was 12, <laughs> I heard of the slam the australian poetry slam mm. through solly Raphael's book he was the youngest winner mm. who was also 12 years old who homeschooled because he struggled in school not academically but because of the pressures which really resonated with me and that book could not have been delivered to me in a better time i mm. really needed to read that and discover something that I could combine my passion and poetry and rediscover my voice really because I, I had a really quiet period where in in school and yeah it was I was with my biggest fans really and I was such a big fan of the Australian Poetry Slam so to be performing for them was incredible and daunting and terrifying all the same but still it was a really cool opportunity and I'm so glad that I've done it yeah unreal have you met Solly in your travels? No, but I have talked to him through messaging before. Amazing. And yeah, and we're in a couple of the same programs for my tour for the rest of the year, Ooh. which is so exciting. Even though we're like a day apart, we're still, it's close. So Great. Yeah, it's really, yeah, it's like I'm half working without meeting my favorite poets. Yeah. Oh, what a dream. What a dream. Yeah, I'm, I'm hoping to, uh, to catch Solly myself and, and get him on the show. That would be amazing. KJ, you and I met at the Victorian State Final at the <laughs> State Library of Victoria, and you were kind of part of a cohort of other young poets from country Victoria who had made it through to the final. You had your, yourself was there, Eve Francis was there, and Eve, both yourself and Eve, made it to the, the national final. There was another young girl there who, her name Mayra. escaped say that again yes, Samira her name was Samira there was another young girl Samira, yeah, Samira there as well yeah I think it was Eve who I heard say something like she was just blown away having come from regional areas to see that there was actually like other people who were into this and there was this thriving scene in Melbourne did you feel the same thing I was because I really did come from like a little country part of Ballarat and mm. then um even like I've traveled Australia and still never really found this as big as it was in Melbourne. Mm. Um, so it was like a big, oh, I found my people. This is exciting. And especially meeting other young people who have shared similar experiences in needing a platform to speak out, uh, speak out those frustrations. And I really think it would benefit a lot of youth mm. and to find those people who have already connected to that the same that I have I find that really motivating those two girls were super inspirational mm. yeah and I loved performing beside them and then standing we were all on the podium at the end of the night and it, it was a huge achievement for all of us and yeah they should be really proud of themselves their poetry was absolutely amazing I watch it I re-watch it all the time on YouTube yeah. Yeah, they were incredible people. Unreal, unreal. Yeah, I think uh, the three of you were definitely very deserving of going through to the final. And I I felt really good knowing that that was kind of the end of the line for me for that year. But I felt really good and really like, yeah, this is right. I think everything worked out how it was meant to. I thought that each of you 
three brought such a a fully formed voice and such a fresh voice and really really uh, strong pieces so it was it was so wonderful to see you all go through i know for example ren who we've had on the show before i know that she's often using <laughs> your work and even samira's work in some of her kind of high school talks and things like that because she wants to show people poets who look like them as she says you know so, oh, i had no idea about that that's awesome yeah i'm pretty sure yeah i'm pretty sure that's that's something that she's doing so fast forwarding to national final sydney opera house you said first time on the plane over the sydney into the opera house something really really unusual <laughs> happened during kind of those final few rounds of the final. Can you talk us through the play-by-play? Yes, the national finals, there are two rounds. And so there was about 12 poets, I think, who at the start, and then it's in going into the second round, there are five poets. And so I was, for one, super excited to be going into that second round, mostly because I really enjoyed the poetry that I'd brought and mm. <laughs> a winning was just not on my mind. It was more, I really want to perform. You know, I love this. Even if I don't win tonight, if I can read out my, both of my poems, mm. that would be super cool. And so then I got one better and I tied with Rob Waters. And so I got to read a third one <laughs> and then we tied again. <laughs> so we got co-champions and it was just incredible because Rob is such an amazing person mm. who is it's just out of this world good at poetry mm. and he is a walking library of stories that Australia just needs to hear mm. and even he wrote a poem about Kinchala Boys Home which has become like a super big part of our homeschool and he's just the impact he's had on our family with his words it just got it's got me thinking like the rest of Australia what are they thinking like he has absolutely no idea just how mm. incredible he is and I am so blessed to be working alongside such an incredible person so there was a double tie a double there tie was. I mean goodness we talk about I don't know Collingwood and St Kilda tying the grand final and having to play again the next week and this kind of thing but can you imagine a double tie and I think from my memory I think the host said look we're going overtime. We have to get some result somehow. We have, we're have. we going to call it. We're going to have two national champions this year. And yeah, it's just wonderful when these things happen. You know, the judges, I should say, are chosen from the audience. So they're not professional judges by any means. They are just people from the public who love poetry, who've come to see it. And, and yeah, it just so happened that everything tied up. I remember what I was going to yeah. say about the Vic final, I was going to say that when Eve said those words, you know, it got me thinking about how special it is to kind of go first and be a trailblazer amongst other people because I'm sure there's other young people from Melbourne and from uh, regional areas as well who, yeah, they're looking for artists who look like them. And it's very exciting to see, yeah, I guess a new class, if you like, of, of poets coming up. Ren and I, we've talked before about how we came to slam in our mid-twenties, more or less. And we just really wish that it had happened sooner. And it's so cool to see it happening at such a young age for yourself and for others. So you're from kind of Greater Ballarat. Is there any kind of spoken word arts scene up there or is it pretty bare bones? What's it like? Yes, yeah, so it took me forever to find an open mic night mm. and... I have lived in Ballarat for majority of my life and yet it didn't it took until like last year before I found something. Mm. But the, it's really fortunate cuz the Australian Poetry Slam are bringing heats and workshops to Ballarat this year that I'll be running so I am excited about that Real. because it's my place I get to bring yeah. it back home a little. Yeah, so that's really exciting and and I'm really glad that they're doing that. Are they building you a statue in the town? <laughs> <laughs> No. <laughs> Not yet. Maybe one day. Maybe you should leave a good word. Who knows? Yeah, so good. So you were 15 when you won the national title. Is that right? Yeah, I was. Yeah. And you mentioned uh, Solly Raphael winning it at 12. I remember seeing a feature night by uh, Solly and asking him a question which might have come across a bit arrogant. I didn't mean it to be. I was more trying to be joking. And I think I'll ask you the same question, which is, yeah. you know, you've experienced such a, an amazing success at, at such a young age, <laughs> how are you going to 
how are you going to keep your feet on the ground to prevent from being some... <laughs> Sorry, it does sound arrogant. The question is, no, how fine, are you going to keep it. your feet on the ground so that this doesn't go to your head, I suppose? I'm not suggesting that it has gone to your head at all, but I don't know. Have you had any thoughts about that? Um, fortunately, I do have that family who are very good at being my cheer squad and also very good at letting me know that I am still one of their sisters and daughters. And yeah. <laughs> in our family, KJ Haywood is very different from Kiera and I think... That's why I switched the name in the Nationals because it is different. It's separate from my home life and I wanted mm. to keep it separate that um, when I'm performing as KJ Hayward, I can go into work mode. I can go, you know, I'm an Australian poet. I'm representing Australia with what I'm saying. Mm. But at home, there's <laughs> there's definitely a very different hierarchy. Sure. And, you know, we're a team, so they definitely keep my feet on the ground. Yeah. <laughs> they keep me grounded. Yeah. And are they teaching you to drive at the moment? <laughs> yeah, they are. Yeah, they yeah. Are. So, so that's probably a big part of it as well. It's look, we're the ones <laughs> we're the ones showing you this. You gotta make sure you listen to us, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. No, I definitely can't bring poetry <laughs> into the car. <laughs> Might lose a little focus. That's it. Oh, that's uh that's really good to hear. Really good to hear. <laughs> I want to ask you, so yeah, you've kind of had this this atypical experience, obviously. Not everyone gets to uh, to become a national poetry champion at 15. You also mentioned that you are, you're homeschooled, is that right? Yes. Cool. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? I've got some people that I know that have been homeschooled in another state. I know it's a little bit different mm-hmm. for everyone, but what has that experience been like? I see. So when I was in grade three, we did a travel around Australia. We traveled around Victoria Mm. for a year and we homeschooled with the intentions that we'd always go back to school. Mm. And then when we did, we just lost our ability to explore and to play. We grew up really quickly and lost our connections with each other Mm. and become like screen addicted and or just really angry people because when we went to school, we suddenly didn't have the ability to speak up for ourselves. We lost our confidence. My sister was everybody's best friend. She was like the biggest social butterfly you've ever met. And all of a sudden she'd be hiding in toilets, avoiding math lessons because the pressure to get a good mark was so high that she felt like she had to hide herself from that. I've become a really angry person. I'd come home and I'd take it out on the people in my safe space because that's where I actually had power, even though I didn't, I I felt powerless. I didn't have a voice. I didn't speak up for myself. And I always was this feisty, outspoken, headstrong girl and then went back into school and that just disappeared. Mm. And then my older sister was having a mental breakdown every day. She was in her first year of high school and she'd be begging my parents that to take her out of school, that this, like she wrote them an essay mm. <laughs> saying that I'm not just having a bad week. This is real. This is scaring me that I have to be in this system until I my entire childhood is mm. revolved around this system of being kept away from my family with, strangers in a room where our parents have no control over our education Mm. at all like everyone is kept separately and we just lost our connection and so she left for homeschool first and we just thought what a great idea and so we all started homeschooling and traveling Australia been doing it for four years now and never looked back and it's really when you step outside of the system that you learn just how many benefits there are to homeschooling and just how not perfect the education system is like we're told from six years old that this is the best idea that you need to put your kids in daycare and then childcare and then school and then for the rest of their lives they're Mm. learning with another person I think that one big turnaround moment for me so that school didn't fit was that we were quite our whole family were quite academically advanced <laughs> and <Yep>. the sport <laughs> was our one thing that we really sucked at uh, oh no <laughs> yeah we just give me a pen and I could write you a million essays give me a basketball and I don't know I'd, I'd probably find a way to hit someone in the head with it but <laughs> it was our bad spot it was our bad spot um, All right. and I there was an athletics carnival coming up 
and I went about it with like an Olympic gold medalist. I was uh, so determined to win the long jump and get into the regional competition that I'd measured up the jump in my backyard. I had like pegs color coding my um, personal best. I was practically, I'd gone mad. <laughs> my entire family joined in. They right. tried to think I was, I still had my sanity intact, but so and then when the competition come around, I come third, which qualifies for the regional. And I was so excited because it's an instant, it's like it's an instant above average mark on, on my report card because I was yeah. going to regionals. And so I was waiting for my PE teacher to give me this, the permission slip to go to the regional competition. And it never came. And so when I went to talk to them, he told me that he'd given it to a girl who didn't show up on the day because he thought that she'd represent the school better. And Ooh. these people, yeah, from six years old, I went to school and these people promised me that they had my best interests at heart. And so here I am with this passion and motivation and I'm putting my best effort into something. And they completely sweep the rug out from under my feet and... Like, suddenly, I'm not good enough because I'm not achieving for them. And that's when I started realizing that school was really a higher fire promote business, where when you make them look good, that's when you'll go further. And after that one, there were more and more situations that I started realizing that that this wasn't the best system. Like, I had a cousin who was told to sit out of nap plan because her scores wouldn't be enough for the school I wouldn't represent them well I had an uncle with dyslexia who was because of a medical report he was too hard to teach and so put at the back of a classroom and told to draw a picture because there, there's no point teaching him because it, it's too hard mm. and he's, he's not going to go far and then there was a conversation that I had with my teacher that were that really impacted me about it was a leadership lesson about what was more important, hope or confidence. And I, in the extended version of the Ode to My Teachers that I performed at the open mic night, there's a little bit of this story in there. And he was saying to me that you're wrong. Hope is not more important than confidence because you can be confident that you'll win a footy match, but you can't hope that you'll win a footy match. And this was my core beliefs. This is what I grew up on. And it was just slammed. It was so easily dismissed that he was right and I was wrong. Mm. And it was so important to me. And I was this 12-year-old who was like shattered. These role models that th who were supposed to care about me just so easily shut down what I had to say, even though that these are the people who are supposed to be educating me. Mm. And so just one after the other, I had these moments of this is not where I'm going to get the education that I need. I'm not learning. I'm learning how to fit myself into a box and say the right things and people please, but I'm not learning for me. I'm not being my best. I'm being the best that they need me to be to win the awards and get on the newspaper. And I know that's not the teacher's fault. It's the systems because schools are a business and they're set up to – raise employees <laughs> and mm. I didn't want to do that I was spontaneous and I had something to say and I didn't want to um and so I got that Sully Raphael book and it showed me that I could combine my talent of writing and my passion to make the world a better place and put it into slam poetry and that's how I started off homeschooling and poetry at the same time so it all came together it was like like an eighth of my life crisis <laughs> yeah so yeah that is a large reason why I homeschool wow thank you KJ thank you for taking taking us through that that was so interesting and and so devastating in a way I'm so sorry that you had those experiences, especially of the the long jump, you it sounds like you worked really hard to work on something that you didn't necessarily feel confident in, and you worked really hard on it deliberately, and you got a result, and it still, yeah, it was almost like a broken promise that it you was, didn't get yeah. the opportunity to try at the next level. That's a real shame. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear yeah. that. And that yeah, no, that's okay because it it definitely has made me who I am now, mm -hmm. and it certainly shaped what my views of education 
And I just think that there's this stereotype that people who homeschool, people who are, they have learning difficulties or it's because of a religion or a culture or they don't socialize properly. But Mm. I was this uh, overachiever in school. I had the good grades. Like I I wasn't unpopular. I had a ton of friends inside what was allowed to be my friends and all the lines drawn that are in school. And so these the kids that are struggling are not kids that are academically challenged. And I think there is a, a really big stereotype that's why people homeschool. Mm. But it's not true. It's that I was there. I was in that situation. I was struggling not because of what was going on in my brain, but because of mentally this was really hard for me to go through. Mm. And all of my family members feel exactly the same. They all all went through similar things. And when I write poetry about school, I really am just a projection of their voices when I stand at that mic. I am one person, but like hundreds and hundreds of stories of not feeling good enough in a system that is supposed to set us up for life. Yeah. Wow. Well said. I must admit that when I was your age, when I was your age, KJ, I probably had those kind of biased ideas about people who are homeschooled, that they were this or that. Mm -hmm. And yeah, just thank you for bringing that up that it's, yeah, it's not the case. People and families make that choice for a whole variety of reasons. And it sounds like in your case, you kind of had some really negative experiences, it sounded like, but also, you know, you were going head to head with some pretty like rigid thinking. You were talking about the confidence versus hope thing. And I was like, that's such a strange thing to ask that question but for it not to be an open question and to not to let yeah. n- and not to let young people answer that or, or rise to that challenge in their own yeah. way, but to say, no, there's a clear cut answer here. There's like this kind of rigid thinking. You mentioned about some of the standardized testing and excluding people because it would reflect poorly on the results, which I don't know if this is the case hundred percent, but I imagine sometimes those standardized results come through to funding and stuff maybe so i think it's it's definitely within the interests of maybe some of these schools to to skew the numbers and uh, it really sounds like you and and your siblings were able to have to come to your own conclusion about hey this isn't working and it's not working for all these reasons and across the board what can we do so it's great that you had some agency to make that decision as a family and you said you you've been doing it like the last 4 years is that right yeah, yeah, we're in our fourth year now. Amazing. And what's it been like when you compare it to some of those stories you just shared? The Certainly the a range of things that I'm learning now is so much more diverse, so much more relevant too. Like I'm finding people out in the, the stereotype that homeschoolers can't socialize is that I have embraced so many people of different cultures and communities homeschooling and traveling mm. Australia than I would ever in in a little brick room with the same people for an entire year and then the next year and then the next year yeah. and just there are so many stories that Australia has to offer and I think that we're really missing out when we sum it down to one single curriculum because Mm. kids are not robots. Like our brains do not work the same. Mm. Um, And education is personal. That Mm. it's it's personalized and it is passionate. And when you really separate things like um, learning from play is that too, it's saying that we are, we're here to work and then we're here to play. But in, in homeschool, we can combine the two and we can go build a hut and we can go build a hut and then write the math about how we did it or the measurements of the sticks that we needed. or And that's technically playing. Mm. But we're learning so much through seeing the world mm. and just also that this schooling has, it does have my best interests at heart because I'm resourcing my own learning. I'm learning with people who want the best for me and who can actually keep that promise. And so it certainly has kept me open-minded and eager to learn. Like that's the thing too, is that you install that spark in a kid to to go seek out an education, then that stays forever. And you really have to, I think that's what needs to change about the school system is that 
we need to work on kids wanting to learn, finding things that they want to learn and adapting the curriculum to what interests them. And school, it doesn't affect everyone. People don't. There are people who do not struggle with it and there are people who fit in the system and that's perfectly okay too. But mm. that's their personalised learning. And But there is, I was one kid in 300 kids in, in one school and so there's going to be another school with another kid who wants personalised learning or more from their learning or people who respect what their needs and their wants. Education is so important and it really is, it's personal and we need to look at it with the individual student, not as a collective classroom or school. Wow. One thing that I sometimes say with my work, for example, if I'm not having a great day and trying to work out some kind of uh, issue with a small business or whatever, sometimes a little thought that helps me is I'll go to lunch and I'll just be like, you know what? We made it up. <laughs> we made up business. Like, not to say that it's not real, but to say like, we made it up. We made the definitions and we had some kind of agreement to the definitions of what this is. And it sounds like it's kind of the same with school. We made school up. Like it didn't used to be a thing. It used to be, you know, a long time ago, you had a family unit or a tribe and they would teach you everything that you needed to know to survive or, or what have you. And school as we know it has kind of only been a thing for a couple of hundred years at most. And so there's room there to make it up again and to revolutionize it if people want it. And obviously that comes down to, yeah, an individual or a family choice in the case of homeschooling, which is great because it's just another pathway. I think that word pathway is important. I know some families, they're very strong about, okay, university is really important, but then of course there's vocational education, which is uh, absolutely like a really important part of learning and contributing to the world and the economy and all these things. Yeah, I think there needs to be more like checks and balances in there. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, so with the schools only been around for um, a couple hundred years is that something that I've learned recently is that school was invented to teach um, kids during the Industrial Revolution to stand at a desk and work by a bell. And from that time, not a lot has changed. We're still <laughs> standing at a desk looking at the clock, um, working for a bell. <laughs> yeah. So it really is that if so many things in the rest of the world can move forward and adapt with as humans grow why are our school systems not like these mm. this is the system that is literally raising our children mm. and yet it hasn't been improved for hundreds of years so yeah. i don't understand why like it, we need to make it modern yeah. and relevant to the kids of today there's so much to learn and so much to inspire us to learn in the entire world. Mm. And it really stumps me why we're not including that in our education. Yeah. I think reform in any sphere is a, it's a big job and there's a lot of be like, it's a lot of people and there's a lot of people with interests in this. You mentioned industrial revolution. I imagine, you know, child's, child slavery and child workers were a big deal back then. So we've managed yeah. to more or less get rid of that. But yeah, some of those other systems are very much still in place. Can you share a bit more about what are some of the unique experiences because of the fact that you're involved in whole homeschooling now? What unique experiences have you been able to have traveling, driving around Australia with your family? There are so many. But yeah. um, my favorite ones was that when we were in Darwin, we worked in a croc conservation park with like crocodiles. I was a parrot trainer there. So we had a variety of animals. We were feeding lions and working with cassowaries, which typically if I went to university, I have to study five years for, but in Darwin, they <laughs> let us. So, yeah. And that was incredible that I taught myself how to train a parrot and had, and yeah, he, he become my best buddy. Uh, we worked in a space museum. Um, we worked in a museum about the history of boats during the war. And they're just the people that we've met. We went to Uluru and did all these classes on Aboriginal heritage and the Anunung people who inherit the area. Mm. And that was the most mind-blowing thing that I've ever seen. Um, the people in Central Australia are the most kind-hearted 
um, we can really learn a lot from them. That was incredible. That was a real spiritual moment. Uh, you never really know how disconnected you are from the country until you go to Uluru. Mm. I know that sounds really touristy, but it's just you have to try it. Yeah. And just the people that we've met along the way are just incredible there are so many conversations to be had australia's a big place with a lot of people and when they share their experiences it saves us from going and making those mistakes because they can pass that on and like you were saying before that's like our tribe <laughs> so our tribe is the rest of australia where everyone can pitch in and teach us because the world is our classroom and so everybody's a teacher everybody gets a chance to be a teacher wow that all sounds fantastic. Uh, I was listening to those going, oh, that sounds amazing. Imagine having all those formative experiences at that stage of your life. When you said you were like working in different centers, how who organizes this? Do you meet up with other groups and then they facilitate some kind of internship? Or Sorry for my ignorance. I just, uh, I'm just yeah, curious. No, that's so good. Yeah. No, it's good to ask questions. I, I really appreciate asking questions because yeah. more often than not, we go, oh, you're a homeschoolers, and then the conversation ends. So for someone to keep the conversation going and be interested is, I really appreciate that. So I uh, thank you for asking these questions. You- I know everyone else in my family, they'd really enjoy this too. With... Our learning, we resource our own learning. So we go, oh, wow, the, the, the Croc Conservation Centre that lets kids volunteer. So we're going to go do that. And then yeah. we go send a few emails or go talk to the boss. Just show up. And, yeah, people are inspired by kids willing to learn. And so they get excited about taking us on and teaching us things that they know. And so, yeah, so our learning is very much we lead it. But I do know a lot of people who have homeschool groups where they meet up and they make their own things. They go on camps together. They run workshops together. But yeah, for my family, we really do resource our own learning. Yeah, love it. Love it, love it, love it. Yeah, wow. That, that's so cool. Thank you for uh, yeah, just widening the lens a bit because like I said, I think uh, I used to have a certain idea about what that is, but really it can be whatever you can make it. It sounds like you and your family have really yeah made the most of it. So that's great. Yeah. It really is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Wow. That's good. Very refreshing. All right. Are you happy to share your second piece now, KJ? Yeah, of course. So I'll share with you my Sydney Opera House winning poem. This is Ode to my teachers. So what we've talked about, this is my experience in school. Writing this poem took a really long time. I'm usually a really spontaneous writer that anything that really stirs me up or pulls at a heartstring, I'll write about it. But this one, I basically come up with the title and then left it for three months because I didn't know what to write. Just when things are closer to me, I find them difficult to get out on the page. But those also turn out to be my best poems. And, well, this one was a winning one, so I guess it's good. But, yeah. Go for it. Ode to my teachers. Today I hold the red pen and I will correct your behavior like you corrected my originality. You will sit, trembling at your desks whilst I drown you out in a waterfall of shh. Because I require a quiet classroom. You tried to shape me like the modeling clay in art class. You pinched my skin, expecting me to mold into some kind of star pupil, only to come away with stained fingers. You'd click your tongues and bestow upon me your interrogative hmms and I sees and soon whispers in the teacher's lounge of lost causes and she's too ambitious would flip out from behind tight-lipped smiles and over the brims of your mugs. Comments like those would be downed with the dregs of cold coffee for the staff room is no safe zone from schoolyard gossip. You stole my voice and hid it in the marble jar and on the student of the week certificate you told me that good girls are quiet girls and quiet girls must raise their hands first. Even then you liked your questions served with an entree of apologies. Um, excuse me miss, but am I interrupting? Once upon a time, teacher, my heart would shoot up through my arm and attach itself to my sleeve every time I raised my hand. And every time you would shoot it down, for I was aflame in your fire bin, and this system is so exam paper thin that it would burn to the ground had I been left unattended. This isn't an ode, this is an epiphany. It's the rebirth of the goody two-shoes and the teacher's pets. It is the handover of the mic to the pen chewers and the desk vandalists. It is the rebellion of the students who will succumb to 
to sitting in silence for all of their school lives. This is a call to shame the bullies who left marks in our hearts and our heads before we even met the ones they warned us about in the playground. So this is an ode to my teachers. You're all dismissed. So cool. I got to say, KJ, that one certainly hits different now that we've spent the last little bit talking about where some of that feeling and some of that language comes from and how personal that is for you. Yeah, thank you for fleshing that out because that really helps bring you light to that. You also got me thinking a bit. I used to work in a school for about 18 months as an aide. So I wasn't a teacher, but I was an aide there to, you know, assist for some funded students. And I'm not perfect. Uh, but I do hope that I really hope that I wasn't someone who gave young people some of those negative experiences that you had. Like I, I hope I did an all right job <laughs> is what I'm trying to say. Yeah. And I know no, that definitely not the teacher's fault. Mm. <laughs> this is they are as much as students in this system as we are. And I think that mum was a kinder teacher that she like we've been on all sides of this system and your hands are really tied when you're given a set of rules to put to 30 kids in a classroom mm. but you know kids don't come with instructions <laughs> so they are learning as much as the students are and I have nothing against teachers because without them you know who who would would be and yeah it is definitely the system that needs a reboot and whilst I have had negative uh, experiences with teachers. I've also had hugely positive ones. And mm. I definitely have a lot of favorite teachers. And they have made a positive impact on my life as, as much as the negative mm. ones. And I am the person I am today because of the people who have taught me from all across Australia. So, yeah, I just definitely want to put out there that this is not a blame game of um, it's the teacher's fault. Mm. No, this is a system that we are stuck in. This is a system that needs rebooting. It's not about the players. It's the game. So I'm sure that you've done a wonderful job. Yeah, it's de you're definitely not to blame. And neither is any other teacher. And they should never feel they should never feel responsible for something that was put in place years and years and years before they were born, so before mm. they were in the teaching industry. Yeah. Yeah, cool. No, thank you for clearing that up. And yeah, there was no, it didn't feel like a, a cheap shot or anything by any means. I, I think you're right in that it's multifaceted, it's challenging, and I'm sure we all know teachers and we know that it's such a hard job and it's underpaid and it's extremely long hours. And maybe the expectations on teachers are just super high in terms of it's not just being an educator, it's almost being, oftentimes it's being emotional support or it's, it's mediating mm. with different things going on with students. So this is a subject that seems to come up over and over again that we, like I can recall so quickly fantastic positive experiences with teachers, but also really negative ones. Like they both stick. So if you are a teacher out there, we just want to encourage you to, to keep doing your best and, and yeah, just you're important. <laughs> you are important and yeah. it, it's a big job to be responsible for a child's learning <laughs> my mom definitely knows she's our homeschool teacher she's got four of them <laughs> we're all very difficult students we have a lot to learn there is a huge responsibility with being a teacher I definitely understand that there's you know with education it is so important it's just important to remember that kids they're not robots that we're not employees we do not all think the same that education is personalized and you know you need to allow room to grow and expand and just learn in the way that that suits the child not the structure of the curriculum yeah well said well said well, this is the point in the show where we usually break it down. And by it, I mean the creative process as much as we can have words for it. I am so curious about how each spoken word artist approaches generating and congregating ideas into their work. So KJ, I don't know, do you have a certain set of practices or anything that helps you put together your pieces? 
I'm quite a spontaneous writer, <laughs> so yep. there isn't really like a sit down. Oh, now I'm going to write a poem about dot dot dot. It's I find anything that I'm passionate about, like watching documentaries or having conversations or meeting people, seeing things. They all spark like I need to write. It's and that's the thing is that um, writing is is I need to. It's how I. It's how I cope. Mm. <laughs> it's how I write. It's how I process things. And so I've always loved the saying that I've got poetry etched into my throat, like written on the inside of my throat. Oh, I love that. Um, yeah, so it, it's always there. <laughs> and it's just a way of working it out. That is the creative process, really. So, yeah, I basically just find things that I'm passionate about and usually it comes out with, oh, I could really write a poem about that. Yeah. Um, and, you know, sometimes there is, I get stuck in like a trance of writing the same things all the time mm. and the same point of view. I, just as much as anyone else, get caught in the one story trap mm. where we only represent one specific view. And so I'll go out of my way to like completely destroy poems that I've written and go, okay, so this person was experiencing this when they did this and really seeing all sides of the story. And that's why I find, so I write a lot about feminism and girls and their body image. So I must remind myself all the time, just as much as anyone else, that you know, boys have body image issues too. And so I find inspiration from this singer-songwriter, Dax, who writes the song How to Be a Man. And it is just incredible. It's such an inspiration. I think that every young male <laughs> needs to look at that. And I think they really resonate with, okay, I need a voice to represent how I'm feeling. that Because it is hidden in the shadows of the mountains of overwhelming statistics that come with girls and their bodies and their sexualities and things like that. Mm. Yeah, and so really going at poetry from all sides and never get stuck, never let rage blind you. It's just that tunnel vision, no change comes from that. That you, you must educate yourself on all sides of the story mm. or else you're not speaking the truth. <laughs> and that's what poetry is about, that we're speaking. We are here to communicate the truth. <laughs> and, mm. yeah, so we really need to remember to write about every single side of everything. Would it's you going on a ramble here. <laughs> no, that's good. Would you say you feel a responsibility to that truth of representing things well? Yeah, mm. definitely. It is. I have an obligation to. I have the words. I have the platform. The microphone's in my hand. That I need to speak for people who don't have voices, and that means everyone, not just a few select stories. That is every single person, every angle. That that is my responsibility, definitely. Wow. Yeah, and some of these issues you mentioned, body image, body. Uh, we'll just use the term body dysmorphia, maybe. Something, an issue like that, or domestic violence, or something like that, it can be, it can definitely be skewed, as in might affect women more than men. But um, that doesn't mean that it's 100%, it's black and white, is what I'm saying. It can be skewed, yeah. but not be black and white, not be skewed all the way to 100%. So two things can be true at the same time. So yeah, thank you for illuminating that. I definitely relate to what you said about being a spontaneous writer, because I've had some people on this show who, are passionate and so disciplined with the way that they write that it's quite incredible. And I've kind of gone, oh, I'm just, I'm not sure if I'm like that. I kind of want to get a bit more of that in me. But yeah, I'm. Yeah, discipline is not a word in my <laughs> vocabulary yeah. when it comes to writing. But I very much almost feel like when I'm in flow, I know it. And when I'm in flow, it's like I need everything else to shut up until I get the thing down on paper or get yeah, the line I down so I can that. come yeah, so I can come back to it later. Because it can just become all consuming. I think when you get the idea, when you get the genesis of a piece, like I'm absolutely sure there are pieces that I've lost, maybe forever, maybe they'll come back around, but maybe forever, because I just said, oh, yeah, I'll remember that in the morning. I'm, I'm drifting off to sleep. Come, something comes to me. And I go, yep, no big deal. And it's gone. It's absolutely gone. So That's my problem is I am most creative. Like I am writing poetry in my head right before I'm about to sleep. Yep. 
And I never have pen and paper, so how I must be like the most prolific poet in the world <laughs> had I have some if I went to bed with a pen in my hand. <laughs> so yeah, there are plenty of poems that I went to sleep with that but they're never coming back. <laughs> yeah, we need some kind of technology that can take them out of our dreams or something and then we'll be sweet. But until now we've just got yeah, the old uh, pen and paper beside the bed, the classic writer's thing. We often talk a lot on this show about cringe or perfectionism and kind of how those two things come together or relate to each other. When I say cringe, is that something that you've felt in yourself? Do you have issues with trying to push through the creative block of like looking at what you're writing and going, oh, this is not as good as it could be or this is, no, no one's going to accept this or is it a little bit uh, easier for you to push through those barriers? I definitely think that, you know, perfectionism is writer's block's best friend. (laughs) Yeah. And so I am always, like, trying to be, like, a rushed poet so that if it's on paper faster, then I'll forget about it and then I won't have a problem with it. Mm. But there are days where I'm like, I really need to say something, but I don't know what the right words are. And those are frustrating times. They're very frustrating when... Things are so important to you. And I people just do not understand that poetry is a need. It's not, I mm. have to write it. It is definitely something that helps me to process the world. And so when something dramatic happens and I can't write that down, that is painful. It is mm. like, it's my worst nightmare. It's, I have to write it down. And that's definitely perfectionism plays a role there because what's the right words? I don't know what to write or... And yeah, that is, that's definitely what starts my writer's block is that I'm so passionate about something that I've actually forgotten how to write poetry. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, it's all part of the shaping, all part of the shaping. Yeah, wow. Another thing that comes up a lot is this particular kind of visual metaphor about, let's say you're going to a spoken word event and it's like everyone is trying to bring the best piece. It's almost like everyone's trying to bring the turkey to uh, to the dinner. But, you know, when that happens, you end up eating turkey all night and you get stuffed full yeah. of the same thing and you get a bit sick of it. So yeah. what kind of food would you use to describe your work, KJ? What are you bringing to the scene in that way? Uh, a food fight. <laughs> That's how I would put it. It is. It's. It's messy. <laughs> That's the best it's answer. Not- yep. Tell us more. Um, I definitely am not a neat writer. I ramble. I have to reorganize things all the time, and nobody's perfect. But the thing I love about performing is that people are so unique. If you've got a story, you just got to tell it before it's gone. That's your responsibility. If you can write, you need to speak. And so I try not to think about it a lot, but that's my special gift is I'm a very, you know, la da oh, like a butterfly kind of person. So I do have that amazing ability to just be okay with what I've written, mm. which I'm sorry for everyone who doesn't have that. But uh, it'll come, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, there, but there are definitely days where nothing about writing makes me happy. Yeah. I'm just, you know, I'm frustrated with what I've written or it's not coming out quick enough or I'll start a paragraph of one thing, ramble into another thing and just nothing makes sense. Um, I'm going off topic and those days of when perfectionism certainly rears its head, but, you know, you just got to stop doing it, move on. <laughs> that's not the poem that you're supposed to write, then that's fine. But poetry comes when it needs to. And you will write something eventually. It's it's not the end of the world. You couldn't write today or tomorrow or next week, but it'll come back. Yeah, I like that. Poetry will, will come when it needs to. Yeah, it'll find a way. The idea will find a way. So maybe it's about just being open and receptive to it and just exposing yourself to stuff like, Again, you've got such a great opportunity being able to travel so much, to meet so many interesting people and to have what sounds like a pretty high degree of agency in your life compared to other people your age. I can certainly see that coming with opportunities and inspiration. What would you say is inspiring you right now? Inspiring me right now Mm. is I'm actually going through one of those rather box stage. So I have like, you know, paragraphs written everywhere that don't connect to anything. The inspiration right now is certainly to do with school is that we're in the bush. So we're always playing games with each other. And I think that 
being a teenager, that's weird. <laughs> For one, you're not supposed to like your family. And two, you're definitely not supposed to play with them. That's what little kids do. And I think people lose that ability to, they just grow up too fast. And I think teenagers, especially around my age, are caught up in that we're adults, but we're kids and we can't make decisions. <laughs> Mm. But make all your decisions and plan your future, but don't make your decisions because you're a kid and you don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. And people just lose their connection with the people that they've been with their whole lives. And I'm really starting to notice that we're not like that. And people don't have that privilege. They don't have that safe space with their siblings and their open relationship as I do. And yeah, that really upsets me. And I am trying to work towards writing a poem about that. Mm. And that, that we're not here to grow up. We've got one life. Everybody's living it for the first time. It doesn't need to be perfect. And be messy. Play in the mud. Build a hut. Climb a tree. Like, doesn't matter how old you are. Mm. If, uh, if the opportunity comes, do it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so true. So true. If there's any young people listening to this at the moment and maybe they have a creative streak in them, but they're considering, like you were considering 12 months ago, I want to show this to someone, maybe not a room full of strangers, but I want to express this somewhere or I want to try my hand at something new. What would you say to that young person? Go for it because... These opportunities, they're not going to land in your lap neatly in a little package. It's just you have to go out and find what's right for you. And I think that people get stuck in the if, when, maybe, when I'm 18 or when I get the job or when I write the poem, when I become a poet. You just got to wake up one day and go, this is what I'm doing. This is it. For today, it might not be tomorrow, it might not be next week, but today I'm a poet. I'm going to find somewhere to, to share this. You just got to, you just really have to put on, I don't know, <laughs> you just have to do it. You just have to mm. just get out and, and do it because if you're always going, making excuses, just you're forever going to wait and your opportunity will never come and you're going to miss out on however many years because you were planning when you were going to start something instead of just starting it. Mm. There's no today is as good as any other day. Be a poet today. Be a poet today. Yeah. And there's never been so many channels of distribution in terms of the tools, the, the poets on TikTok, the poets making YouTube shorts, whatever it may be. There's never been so many channels of distrib distribution to just have a go because if you're constantly sitting on an idea and it never comes to fruition because you think it's not going to work or people won't like it or whatever, that becomes the self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of you didn't do it. You didn't do it. So it didn't work because you didn't do it. So you had that bias in place. I, I can really relate to that. Can I ask you, KJ, do you feel, I don't know, do you feel any sort of pressure around your work now that you have achieved this wonderful uh, title? The wonderful thing about having KJ Harewood and Kiara <laughs> is that I can really separate the two. Yeah. And, you know, there are days where I wake up and I'm going to be like, I'm working today. I'm going to be in KJ Harewood mode. I'm going to write the poem. I'm going to organize some schedules or whatever. But I really have to put myself in the mood. <laughs> yeah. But also just going, this is not my whole life. I'm still the person who likes walking around barefoot, playing ukulele, reading books, singing songs, building campfires, I can be that person too. Mm. And I don't want this to consume my life because mm. I love my life at the minute. It's I've got a really cool thing going. And whilst this is an amazing opportunity, is I am not made of poetry. <laughs> I do other things and mm. I like other things too. Yep. And, you know, I'm 17 in October. I have a, a long life ahead of me. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to live that first. <laughs> Yeah, certainly. There's no reason you have to lock yourself into anything. My next question was going to be a version of, are you interested in pursuing creativity in whatever form as, I guess, a life pursuit or a career or whatever words you want to put to it? But I wanted to say that with the caveat of no one knows what they want to do. Like adults are all making it up. I've been like a journeyman myself in all kinds of things. It sounds like you're kind of saying that, hey, th this is great, you're loving it, but you're not, yeah, you're not defined by it. You've got so much time to try things and to figure out other things. And I'm sure I speak for a lot of people where 
we say we hope that you continue to, to operate in this space. But, you know, you don't owe that to anyone. You can absolutely leave that be and go do whatever you want. And, and that goes for anyone, really, who's yeah. currently doing works. So yeah. Did you have any thoughts around that? It's always going to be my passion to, mm. to speak and I'm always going to want to be a motivational person, someone that other people can look up to. I want to, I want to make others happy. If I can enter a room and spew out a poem and reach one person in that room, then that's success for me. But that's all I need. Like mm. if that one person is affected by a conversation I have with them, then that person can go on and have a conversation with another person and you don't need me after that. You've already started like a spider web of, of change, of creating poetry, of using your voice, of representing others. And whilst I am a spark, I am not everything. <laughs> and, you know, I'm still a person and mm. so is everyone else. And everyone else is as capable as I am. That, And I think I am quite the epitome of you know going zero to hero and if you're all feeling like zeros right now then do something and tomorrow you're gonna you, you'll get that 100 you, you'll mm -hmm. be the person that you want to be you've just got to go out and do it and i think everybody lives for the future and that's the thing is that there's no time for what am i doing now or who do i want to be now it's what I want to do, how much money I want to make, or if I could, uh, you, then I would have. But the thing is that when you're old, you're not going to sit on your deathbed and be like, geez, I wish I had more money, or I wish I was prettier. Or you're going to say, I wish I didn't have all of these dreams. I wish I had memories to share with people. And I think that's so important, and it's a lesson that... People just don't understand that we've got one life and things need to happen now. And, you know, mm. your now starts whenever you say it does. And if it doesn't work out, then restart it. <laughs> like, there's no pause button. <laughs> yeah, it's um, never too late. I mean, it, these are all cliches, but they're cliches because they're true. Like, it's never yeah. too late. I know, I mean... I, I don't know what it's like to be your age and think about the future and maybe people speculate about the future of the planet and the environment and stuff. And no one knows exactly what's going to happen. You know, yeah. there's work to be done. Absolutely. But no one knows exactly what's going to happen. And the odds are that the future will look something that's not as bad as what some people have said it might get and probably not as good as what some people said it would get like. It'll be somewhere in the middle, most likely in that big stretch. And the same when you put that down to an individual life, when you think about your future and I don't know, maybe someone's listening and they, you know, they think their best days are behind them or, or something. I just think that people are so busy ticking boxes of, yeah. you know, like get the car, go to uni, get the dream job, then marry someone and have your 2.5 kids and <laughs> you peak at 25 and then what? Like you can't just live your life unhappy because you've done everything. Yeah. For, and, you know, that's the thing is that it did, your life doesn't end at 25, <laughs> despite what people think. Yeah. And I just think that if we're so focused on a future that nobody can promise, then what are we doing now to change that? Because it starts today. Tomorrow's the future. What are you doing to improve tomorrow? But in 20 years' time, no one knows what the world's going to look like. I don't mm. know what I want to be. I don't know who I'm going to be. But if today I can make a little bit of change or spread a little bit of kindness or give a smile to a person because it was free and they needed it, that's something that I am in control of. And I don't need to know everything to, to do that like that's something that it's small but it, it's impactful and it might change someone and having this conversation with you a listener they might be on the other end and maybe something that I said caught their attention and then they can go out and spread that too and you, that starts now we don't need a future for that mm. yep not one it's like not one day when yeah that, yeah. that delay of yeah there'll be a point where I do this, I try this, or when it's perfect, or when I feel ready. You're never going to feel ready, I suppose. <laughs> no, feel the fear and do it anyway. That is my family motto. <laughs> yeah, and sounds like you, you did that. You talked about the nerves that you had at your, your first uh, public performance. I did want to ask you, when you won the title, uh, did you have some kind of... You had some badges or something on? Yeah, I did. Did they have any kind of personal significance, those? Or? Yeah. So 
That first performance was in this little business called TBH Studios, and they had a ton of body positive messages in all forms of art, and one of them was badges, and I just we decided to got one, and then lucky me was heading to Shepparton, and I was like, oh, well, these badges can be my good luck charm then. So it went from having one on that night and then it's nine now so I have nine badges and they it's a bit like my superhero cape yeah. and I always like to share the story of the lab coat project which is a scientific study that a group of scientists gave a bunch of a different groups these lab coats and they were all the same white coats they were just mm. white coats they told one group that they were artist coats they told another that they were scientists and another that they were doctors And the people in the artist group, they were more creative in the tasks that they were asked to do, whilst the scientists, they were measured and calculated, and the doctors, they were kind and patient. And it's because our brain convinces ourselves that what we're wearing on our body, the way that we're acting, impacts how we come across. Mm. And so if I'm wearing my badges, that's my lab coat that I can put that on and go, today I'm going to be the world's greatest poet. And even though I'm not, (laughs) I can still put that on and then the world's greatest poet isn't going to stutter and stumble. They've got something to say. They've got lunch with Miles Merrill after this. They're fine. (laughs) They're going to be fine because they've done this before. And even if you are nervous, if you have, you can hide behind your lab coat a little and you will come across as more confident because it will stick in your brain. And yeah, that's how I handle nerves is that I put my badges on and I'm KJ Hayward. I am the world's greatest poet. Even if I'm not, I'm going to believe that until something comes of it. Yeah. And I think that's the reason why people and artists have had alter egos, stage names, personas, um, Ziggy Stardust makeup, like whatever it is that gets you in the zone of mastery. Even if a lot of people do relate to almost like playing a character on stage. I relate to that. I feel like... I, I'm using a voice and whatever that I wouldn't normally use. So that's, uh, yeah, super, super common. Going back, I might splice this in somewhere. I found it refreshing as well that even though you've had this win, like you, you were a little bit hard to get in contact with, KJ, in that I could only find you on Insta and whatever and, and then Instagram blocks me because I thought I was a bot just going on and messaging random people. But it was cool because I was like, I'm not seeing what I see with some young people is that I don't know what your relationship with technology or social media is, but you know, it is very strong and very addictive. And I do see a lot of people all across the board, but especially young people who are caught up in that and caught up in an attention economy. And I didn't really get that, that impression from you. Do you have any thoughts about, I don't know, social media at large? <laughs> um, I have quite a lot of thoughts. Awesome. Um, social media can be both a good and a bad thing for my platform that I call it my work thing <laughs> is that Instagram is it's purely work orientated it's to pitch myself advertise events and things which mm. I've been terrible at lately but then again I haven't really got my schedule until this month things are coming so keep looking at it because th- things are coming we'll talk but about these again, things in a second yeah yeah <laughs> it's also really dangerous and not in the sense so much yeah too that that it's a bunch of strangers on one platform but in the same sense that you know you're looking at perfection all the time and it's unrealistic and you're comparing your life your body to these unrealistic expectations that are so hard to achieve that they're just they're impossible and that's really damaging and I'm really lucky to have parents and like a family who they're supported of me as I am in real life (laughs) and we're not big social media people that we can feel when we're getting addicted to it we can go oh I messed up today I spent an hour on uh, scrolling on Facebook or something Mm. and I think it's in that openness where we can go social media isn't for us that we are real private people and that's why I only have an Instagram so sorry that it was so hard to (laughs) to find (laughs) no it's not a problem it was an adventure I was like I want to find KJ how do I find KJ (laughs) and then just tried to figure it out Well, yeah, I'm glad you did because this is a great opportunity. Yeah. Yeah, we're not big social media people. That was This is like the first public account I've ever had in my entire, you know, teenage mm. years of having technology. 
Yeah, and I, I like to keep it that way because, again, it's not Kiara who gets on Instagram. It's KJ Haywood, and she's there for work stuff, and she's mm. there to talk to people. And, yeah, it helps to keep it separate, and I appreciate it's there for advertising, but it's not a world that I want to get caught up in. It is damaging, and it just it ruins people. And, mm. you know, there's no easy way to put that. It just it does. It brings out the worst in people. And it also, you know, it, it's the base for a whole lot of anxiety and self-hatred, which I'm a big body image advocate. Mm. And this is certainly one huge cause that people are missing because it's so addictive. And, like, parents of kids who are addicted are like, why should they stop? Because if if I if the parents are addicted, then why should the kids stop? Because they're role modeling. <laughs> and yeah, it it's sad, but it can also be helpful. So I do have mixed feelings about it. I prefer not to share my life on there. Yeah, yeah, we are private people, yeah. and it's a little bit of protection to to just not expose ourselves like that. Yeah, yeah. So that that's my personal choice. Totally. No, that's great. I feel inspired by. Writers like Johan Hari, who in his book Stolen Focus, talks a lot about his kind of vision for what social media could become if we want it to. Because right now, so many of these tools, they're free. And when something's free, it's not really free because you put all your data into there and people like sell them off and whatever. So you become the product, right? And it becomes about how much time you spend using the tools. That's how people get money out of you. Johan was saying that, could it be that the whole business models of these things could change so that they became maybe a paid service so they didn't rely on the advertising side of things, but you paid to use Instagram, Facebook, whatever you like, but then it became a tool that would serve you and your interests. So if you wanted to use social media, for example, to be like, okay, I, I want to meet, I want to use it as a tool for more in person experiences, meetups, meeting new people, whatever. It could become that and it could become a tool that allows you to get out of the ecosystem and into real life experiences. I feel really inspired by that. And I think if there was enough pressure put on these companies, we could definitely make it so that they had to change their business model. Because I was like, yeah, that sounds great. Like using a tool that so often we talk about, oh, it's meant to connect us and it tends to divide us. Well, can we change the business model so that it becomes that thing that can connect us outside of its own ecosystem again? Does that make sense? Yeah, it yeah. does. There's no doubt that social media is a great connection tool. It's just to do with, you know, who you're connecting to, mm. especially young people are being influenced by people that are just not good for them. And yeah, and, and that's scary, <laughs> is that and the thing too, that such little people are selling themselves mm. on these platforms that aren't made for them and that, you know, their brains can't cope with. They don't know mm. the danger of that. And uh, I don't know. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what to think with it, honestly. If you're like me, then you'd just rather avoid it. <laughs> yeah. It's still so and, new and, and it's so unregulated. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And there's saying that we're the canaries in the coal mines for this thing that mm. it's not finished. It's not safe. And I actually find it really ironic that Instagram's blocking you as a bot mm. where there are people on there doing actual dangerous things that aren't being called out for anything. And it's interesting what it does regulate. Mm. And, you know, it could be regulating a lot more. It probably should be. <laughs> mm. But, yeah, it's not safe because it's not properly tested. And then you're throwing in kids as young as eight developing anorexia because, you know, oh, the influencers do it. Mm. <laughs> and I need an eating disorder to be beautiful. You've got boys with, like, you know, the fitspiration stuff that you see. And that, that really creates an enormous level of body dysmorphia and body dissatisfaction. And also things that it's being given to kids so early on that it's changing the makeup of our brains and that kids who have technology before they're two are more likely to develop like ADHD. They can't settle. Their brains are always needed for that, that dopamine release. Just there's so many dangers that they're just not accounted for and it's not just the images it's it's the people on there it's who you're connecting with it's what it's advertising the kind of system it's creating the kind of world it's creating yeah. in general 
Yeah. Yeah, well. So looking to the future now, KJ, what's next for you? You're about to head off on some more travels and some touring adventures up the East Coast. Is that right? Yes. <laughs> yeah. So we've got um, the Byron Riders Festival in Byron Bay, which, you know, it's going to be interesting because Sydney and Byron and all, it's like the Hollywood <laughs> of Australia. <laughs> you know, like we all come from this little small country town outside of Ballarat and it was a very big culture shock when we went to Sydney for the first time when there's a lot of Botox liquid diets and Chris Hemsworth lives here and he has been here he's eaten here and you know it's like it really is like the movie star world of Australia it's going to be interesting but yeah there's I've got some school talks going on which I'm really excited about because school in both homeschool and what we call regular school, it changed who I was. And if I can reach out to one person in a school crowd and do the same as that Solly book did to me, then that's incredible. And if I could go back and tell 12-year-old me that I was going to be in a book that's inspiring someone who's struggling in school, I'd be over the moon <laughs> like I am now. So, Do you know yeah, the name really of that Solly to- book? Pardon? Do you know sorry? the name of Solly Raphael's book? I'm just looking it up now. Yeah, Limelight, sorry. Yeah, Limelight, Limelight by Solly Raphael. Awesome, yep. Cool. So the Byron Writers Festival, any other like major events that you'll be appearing at where people can see you perform? So there is the Ride Around the Murray Festival, which is Aubrey Wodonga. I'll be running heats and workshops in, in regional Victoria and, yeah, and some of New South Wales. There's the Big State Finals in Melbourne. I'll be a feature at that. Yeah, these are the ones that are confirmed right now. We're still working on the schedule. But yeah, so definitely I will be posting the schedule on Instagram. So yeah, (laughs) that's where everything will be if you want to find me. Brilliant. Is this your kind of first time going around doing these, these kind of engagements or did you get to do some after the title last year? Yeah, so these are the first times that I've been in person. I've done some radio talks and a lot of interviews. I have been working on Teen Breeds magazine, which is this really cool magazine that it's for teenagers, which really supports body image, which is right up my alley. I've got an interview published on that. That comes out July 1st. And then, yeah, I've just got some interviews published directly after the win. But, yeah, this is when the tour starts in August. There you go. Wow. It sounds like it's going to be a a fantastic experience. So much opportunity to speak with people your age and also, yeah, just hit up some of the, the biggest writers' festivals in the country. Now, where if people want to find out more about you, KJ, is there anywhere that they can follow you or see your work? You mentioned your Instagram before. Yeah, that's definitely where KJ Haywood <laughs> lives on the Instagram. Sure. <laughs> yeah, so that all upcoming events will be posted onto there. So anybody can check it out. Um, it's a public account. So, yeah. <laughs> cool. And we'll, <laughs> uh, <laughs> we'll link to that in the show description along with some more information about some of those events. Yeah, I think July through to kind of October is peak season of spoken word around Australia with everything that's yeah. happening. So we are about to, to get right into it. This has been such a pleasure, KJ. You've got one more piece that you're going to leave us with just before we wrap up. Did you want to talk about that one? So this is definitely one of those that took a while to write to. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So this is called Wolves and this is new content. This hasn't been performed anywhere. Yeah, and this is recently written. I hope you enjoy. (laughs) I thought wolf whistles only happened to little girls in skimpy outfits. Short skirts and tank tops, girls out way past their curfews. Girls seeking attention from men, still a violation of their privacy, sure, but clearly provoked. You know, like chosen. So like a good feminist, I wore buttons up and skirts down in town. I was appropriately clothed, came home before dark, stayed safe in numbers, stayed alert. So you can imagine how blindsided I must have felt when my sisters and I were wolf whistled, waiting for the green walking man holding our nine-year-old brother's hand in the middle of the afternoon on our way to the gelato shop. To my knowledge, this was completely out of context. So like good girls, we held each other closer, we kept our heads down. They were nearly as many years older than us as my brother was old. Fortunately, it's easy to hate strangers. 
However, it's not so easy to have people who are supposed to love us tell us to take it like it was a compliment. Turn our hate yous into thank yous because good girls should be grateful to be graded on their good looks. And like a good feminist, I didn't listen. <laughs> because I remember watching a girl a similar age to my brother pull up her bather bottoms at a public swimming pool. A violation of her privacy, practicing her strut, performing in front of the teen girls with their G-strings for compliments. And I remember how my stomach did a backflip off of the deep end and landed at the bottom of my heart because, to my knowledge, this was completely out of context. Because what sort of wolf had crawled its way into her brain and whistled her name to behave this way at such a young age? So I turned my hating into changing. Looked those wolves in the eyes and knelt down to my brother and said, This is disrespect, and you will be so much better than them and the wolves. We're silent. Fantastic. Wow. Thank you for the exclusive as well. Good. Yeah. Yeah. That one was certainly hard to write. It was two experiences that I've had that really shook me. We met this, well, we didn't really meet. We watched this little girl in Catherine in the Northern Territory who was struggling with a body image in the way that you know, grown-up struggle with body image. And there were these teenagers in their bathers that she'd just become obsessed with almost. And it was really sad to see, you know, such a little girl who was like eight eight years old mm. struggle with how she was looking. And you just know that she's going to go home and look in the mirror and not think that she's good enough. She's going to find those flaws and... At such a young age, she's supposed to be worrying about, you know, making Play-Doh and yeah. taking splinters out of her hands from climbing trees or things. Mm. Not these adult problems that she sh just should not have faced. Mm. And then you wonder why those things happen. And then you get that the wolf whistle situation where I was with my brother in the middle of the town in the middle of the day. We were going to get ice cream. It was like the most innocent situation that you could get. And yeah, and these guys sitting in a Bob wolf whistled us and I just thought that was so unfair you know who are you to comment on my body when mm. I'm a kid and you're clearly not and you don't know me <laughs> and mm. yeah it just it was really something that shook us all up I reckon and that was definitely something that took a while to write about because of the impact it had on all of us on both situations, they really tied nicely together. So I'm glad that I did wait to write about it. And yeah, it just reminded me again why I write for those girls who aren't safe walking in the street, you know, trying to get an ice cream with their little brother. Mm. And then those girls who aren't safe in their minds and the, and the ways that they're, they're viewing themselves at such a young age. I am a huge advocate for body image and self-love. It is super important to me. And it really does break my heart when I can't fix it. I can't fix you <laughs> with mm. words when you hate yourself. This is the worst kind of hate. It's really something that only the person experiencing it can fix. And so I really hope that sort of poem has an impact on people, both those the, the men in the bar <laughs> and those little girls have someone to look up to who is who's not different, who is different to other people. Someone who uses their voice or, you know, I don't wear makeup, so I want people to see me for who I am and, and find a role model and find a role model there that isn't the same as everyone else, you know, the same mould that they have to fit their bodies in. One size does not fit all <laughs> and... I really hope that my words can reach people like that who, who need it, who need to get out of that self-hating. Thank you, KJ. And I think your words have, and I think your words are, and I think your words will continue to reach those people. So thank you for, for just illuminating that really important issue for us. KJ Hayward, this has been just a delight. I can't remember the last time I spoke to a young person who had such a refreshing view of the world and themselves and the deliberate choices that they're making and who was so articulate about the things that they care about and the direction that they point their creativity in. I think I speak for the whole 
Melbourne and Australian and global spoken word community that we're so proud of you uh, for everything you've achieved and we're cheering you on into the next stage, whatever that looks like. Again, you don't owe anyone anything. So if this was just a one and done or just a stage, that's absolutely fine. But we do hope that you continue to show us what you've got and, and to bring your stuff and to use your voice to see the kind of change that you want to see the in the world. So thank you for your buy-in and thank you so much for coming on. I think therefore I slam. Yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. You definitely have not seen the last of me. I'm not that easy to get rid of. <laughs> yeah, while I'm writing, I'm really enjoying it. I'm enjoying the people that I'm meeting through it. You being one of them, you're an incredible artist and such a kind and humble person. And if you're not like a TV representer because you're just the best at interviews. <laughs> I remember <laughs> wow, <laughs> thank you. talking to you in the green room was like, oh, wow, this guy is really good at asking <laughs> questions. Yeah, you stumped me on a few back in Melbourne. Yeah, I've really enjoyed talking to you, sharing my story. And thank you so much for inviting me. This opportunity has been absolutely amazing. It's always something I wanted to do and I couldn't have asked to do it better with such an awesome person like yourself. <laughs> Thank you, KJ. That's very humbling. We'll uh, see you around the traps, all right? Yes. <laughs>